Good morning, everyone. And can I welcome everyone to the third meeting of the Social Security Committee and our very first meeting of a roundtable discussion. Everyone will know that this is probably the largest uh, piece of legislation that uh, we in this parliament will be looking at, and uh, I look forward to this morning's uh, roundtable discussion. Can I remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones as they can interfere with the sound system here. And I've also been asked that people stay about a foot away from the microphones uh, to enable the sound system to work uh, properly. Now, our first uh, agenda is uh, work programme priorities. And as it is an evidence session of a roundtable format, and we want to have a further two roundtable discussions. And this is going to look at uh, focus on the priorities in the medium and long term of the session of this parliament. Uh, I just want to say if anyone wants to ask a question or make a contribution, could you please indicate to myself and uh, actually speak through the chair and could I also ask that any contributions are short and succinct, that's questions and answers, and basically we'll be able to get round through as much uh, questions and answers as possible and get more information in the time we have in this committee. Can I welcome our witnesses here today? Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, I'll just read out the witnesses, who they are. Uh, Eddie Follin sends his apologies uh, from Bernardo's, uh, and also we have from... Uh, in gender, uh, Jill Wood could make it, so we have Alice Mumford instead. And I'm sure everyone will introduce herself as they, they go along as well. We're very grateful to your written submissions, which you have put in. And uh, thank you very much for, as I said, coming along and sending in the written submissions also. Now, if I would just start this discussion by opening up a general question, then I'll open it up to members uh, to ask any questions or any contributions they may wish to put forward. Now, we all know that this week the Parliament acquired new social security powers. Uh, we know that the Scottish Government plans sorry, uh, to bring forward a social security bill early next year. And we also understand that the Scottish Government plans to bring forward a child poverty bill. And I think that's something I expect this committee will uh, have a, a great deal of interest in. So in light of what's been said previously and, and what we're expecting the Scottish Government to bring forward, uh, could I just open it up by asking everyone uh, around the table uh, what you would see as being the key priorities uh, for this committee? And who wants to start off? <laughs> oh, OK, Nicola. Hi, I'm Nicola Dickey from COSLA. Um, I think in our evidence submission, we, we highlighted the fact that we welcome the opportunity to provide views via the consultation that the Scottish Government um, has launched. But for our organisation, I'm sure many of the other organisations around, around the table, there's something about having a, a look at the long-term integration of the social security. So the, the consultation itself asks very specific questions and in other parts very general questions and, and that's helpful but there's very little opportunity to talk about the kind of long-term um, integration of how that would sit in the, the fabric of Scotland if you like around about the other public services that are already delivered to Scotland and public services that will be delivered to Scotland as we kind of move forward so I think we would be interested in um, providing evidence around about that type of integration. Thank you very much. Anyone else want to Sorry, Rob. Yeah, I think in, in general terms, um, there, are, there are two broad areas. One is the new powers and the Social Security Bill, both in terms of what um, the new benefits will do and what the possibilities are there, but also how you enshrine dignity and respect in the new system, um, how, um, and how it's to ensure that the system is well administered and works well for people as it, um, citizens of ICE bureaus a lot of the, the issues we'll see are related to administration issues. Um, but there's also the, I think we would see as equally important that we don't decide to the system that, that currently exists. Um, there's a range of problems, a range of issues that <clears throat> will affect um, Scotland citizens every day um, by the, um, the current reserve system. Um, the, the previous Welfare Reform Committee did a lot of um, really important work on that, and I think that that, um, that would be good to see that, that continue if possible. Thanks, Rob. Anyone else? John? I think we'll be 
um, to ensure that as the transfer of powers happens and as Scottish Parliament takes on responsibilities for, for those elements of social security, that we make sure that the administrative systems are in place to ensure that those who rely on these sources of financial support continue to get the, the benefits uh, that they, they need. Um, so actually that kind of focus on administrative delivery, absolutely key. Um, I suppose two other key points I'd, I'd be quite keen to make is um, first urge the committee not to, to confine itself to the parameters of the, the Scottish Government's consultation. We very much welcome the principles that are set out in that consultation, the tone of the consultation, um, and the opportunities to inform how um, the new powers uh, might be used in relation to the specific benefits that are being devolved. Um, we're working on our response to that consultation. I'll share that uh, as soon as we, ha we have that. Um, but we were disappointed that the, the consultation itself fails to uh, consult on how some of the key powers that have been devolved might be used. So the power to top up reserved UK benefits, the power to create new benefits in, in devolved areas. I mean, that, that is used to some extent. But the key one, how that power to potentially top up uh, UK benefits might be used. And in terms of ensuring that Social Security plays its full role in tackling poverty, tackling inequality, and I think that's a power that needs to be focused on. Um, we as Child Poverty Action Group are particularly keen at looking how we might top up family benefits and have um, promoted the idea of topping up child benefit. Uh, that could have a big impact on levels of child poverty uh, in Scotland. And then the other, sort of, the other second area I kind of urge the committee to scrutinise and, and to prioritise is that kind of issue around the administration and the delivery of, of benefits uh, and to, um, to, to make sure that you scrutinise the, the, the recommendations that emerge from the stage two uh, options appraisal that is, that, that's referred to in the consultation document that the Scottish Government is currently undertaking. So that, that's kind of happening in parallel to the consultation process, looking at what the delivery options uh, are for delivery of benefits in Scotland. Uh, I think it's crucial that there really is some uh, you know, thorough scrutiny and a chance to, to, to respond to what emerges from that, that process. Um, and again, we'll maybe come on to this, but again, we believe, uh, along with many others, that, the, that in general, Scottish social security benefits should be delivered uh, on a national uh, basis. Thank, thank you very much, John. Yes. Sorry. Um, Ali. Thank you. So, um, uh, Alison, again, apologies. I'm subbing for Jill, so there may be some, some questions I'm, I have to refer back to her. Um, but in terms of our sort of key priorities, um, a really key one for us would be to ensure that um, gender equality and equality more generally is embedded in the process as an objective, um, and it's, it's mainstreamed throughout um, throughout the work, and it's seen as, as an outcome in and of itself. Um, so, mainstream through the development, through the delivery, through the consultations. Um, that's really essential that gender equality is specifically in the, in, in the legislation, in primary legislation. Um, as lots of people have mentioned, the, the, the delivery is really important and we must make sure that um, the social security system in Scotland isn't simply a replication um, of what systems we know aren't working in many, many ways. A really key one um, for gender and the women we work with is um, the delivery of universal credit payments um, and a really immediate priority for us will be the um, for universal credit entitlements to be automatically paid to individuals rather than a household payment. Um, we've done a lot of work around this and it's, it's generally seen as, as a regressive model to have a household payment. It entrenches existing gender inequalities um, and puts uh, many women in a very very vulnerable situation. So I think that's, that's a key priority, um, certainly for gender, and we would hope for the committee. Um, and then finally, looking at um, integration of, of all the discussions around new powers and a lot of, um, certainly the... Um, the measures will be calling for many other organisations, such as topping up of benefits, um, carers' living wage, destitution funds. Th these are aspirational. We understand that um, you know, we, we live in a context of, of budgets, so we want these approaches that are joined up in discussion with, um, with uh, considerations around Scotland's new tax-raising powers and, um, and looking aspirationally about what this social security system could be. Thank, thank you very much. Anyone else want to... Kieran? Oh, Kieran, sorry. Thanks. Um, Kayleigh. Kayleigh from Enable yes. Scotland. Um, just to pick up on a couple of points around the table, um, Nicola talked about integration. Um, I think it is important that we look at the social security entitlements that already exist in Scotland and we don't look at the new social security benefits as uh, in isolation. So how do we actually create a system that integrates your entitlements so that it's a simple access, sim there's a simple straightforward way to access all of your entitlements, so for example, for people who have learning disabilities who are entitled to PIP, 
in its current form, um, why can't we just make sure that they then get access to their concessionary travel bus pass uh, automatically? So it's embedding that degree of automaticity in, into the system. The, in terms of integration, there is also the, the complex interplay with the, what will remain reserve benefits, and I think there is some scrutiny needed um, into what, what what that means for people, what that means in reality, how people are navigating what is going to be an increasingly complex system. Um, on that point, I would suggest that the, the advice sector is going to be fundamentally important there, and I think that needs to be greater embedded within the social security system. Um, and also in terms of um, not confining ourselves, and that's something that, that John touched on, um, the, the top up opportunities, opportunity to create new benefits, I think we need to look at the impact of current welfare reform that we're seeing at the UK government level. For example, for, for our members, the, the ESA work-related activity group cuts is, is, is going to be huge come April next year. Um, and I think we need to look at what opportunities there are in Scotland using the new powers to, to address that. Um, so, so that's some of the priorities I'd like to see. Thank, thank you very much. Is it for... <coughs> Thanks, <Madam> Chair. <coughs> um, yeah, just to reiterate what John, one of John's points about it being a national service where um, Care Scotland would really, and, and all the carers we've spoken to, uh, feel that there are already enough situations where there is a postcode lottery of support and services, um, and that this isn't an opportunity for another one of those. So we should really make sure that wherever you live in Scotland, you're entitled to the same um, benefits and to the same way that it's delivered. Um, so whatever structure is in place to do that. Um, and in our submission, one of the things that um, we were conscious of, I suppose it goes back to the original debate um, about which bits of welfare would be devolved, because we were always, um, and I think the sector as a whole was conscious that if you create two systems, then it doubles the number of people you need to speak to, um, in terms of it potentially doubles the number of people you need to speak to to get um, all the things that you may be entitled to. Um, which sort of goes against some of the other directions of travel. So, for example, with the integration of health and social care, one of the principles is that you know it's you can't be bounced between one system and the other. Health can't say, sorry, that's a social work problem or vice versa. So you should just be able to go to one person who, irrespective of what's going on behind the scenes in terms of who holds the budgets, etc., it's not the person at the receiving end that has to be made aware of that. It's not really their problem. And, there's a danger in this new system that we, we create a tension between those two things. I mean, we recognise we haven't got what everybody asked for, so we're going to have to make the best of it. But that connection between the two systems is really crucial. And the other thing, in terms of the transition period, which John mentioned as well, um, you know, we need to make sure that when it kicks in, it works for people. Um, but part of the issue which we're already facing, I think, is that, is that we need to be very clear about when things are going to happen. Because when announcements are made, so when you pass the acts, so the, um, or you, you make announcements in the media, we start to get calls with people either being concerned about changes to their situation or expecting that new things are going to be available. So we just need to be very clear all the time um, when things are going to happen. I mean, obviously, things have already slipped with the implementation of universal credit. It just puts a huge demand onto the sector who's providing advice um, and also puts a lot of stress onto people who are in the middle of it and they're hearing things and you know with social media nowadays it can be out in a minute that something's changed and you know it may not be coming in for another two years so we just have to be conscious of that I think yeah. as we go forward. Thank, th thank you very much I think there's some very good contributions I'll open it up to members for questions. Ben? <laughs> Many of you, thanks very much. That was uh, fa fascinating and, and all insightful. Uh, a lot of you mentioned the, some of the concerns around the current system, and I wondered if you would be able to comment more, more widely on that, particularly with regard to the sanctions regime. That is something that uh, I, as an MSP, and I'm sure the other MSPs around the room are, are receiving constituents' concerns around those issues on a, on a regular basis. Yes, um, I mean, no, clearly far too many um, from families, families with children are being impacted by um, the current approach to conditionality and the imposition of, of sanctions. Um, it's causing very real 
hardship. Um, you know, people are ending up having to use food banks. People are ending up uh, in very severe difficulties. Um, I think we have to be clear that the, the reality is that the, the, the benefits associated with work-related conditionality and sanctions will remain reserved. ESA, Job Seekers Allowance, IS, those, those benefits uh, remain reserved. Um, having said that, there are things that uh, we think Scottish Government Parliament can do with the new powers to minimise the uh, risk of sanction uh, and reduce the numbers of people who, 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 who might be affected by sanctions. So in particular, the use of the new employability powers um, to ensure that uh, employability programmes in Scotland uh, provide uh, opportunities and activities that are appropriate uh, and relevant to the people uh, using them that are based around the, 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 the user's needs um, and aren't inappropriate too often inappropriate activities are imposed on people, they're then unable to, 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 to undertake those activities, breach the terms of the benefit and then find themselves uh, at risk of sanction. So ensuring that employability programmes are designed in such a way as to um, provide uh, support that actually meets people's needs uh, and also ensure that employability programmes when uh, devolved uh, limit the number of mandated activities, activities that, uh, uh, that, 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 that are attached to the conditionality regime. So there are, I think, some concrete ways in which um, the risk of sanction can be reduced. Um, we certainly be keen to explore all options. I think it is important that we do everything we can w w with the powers and with the new relationship between different levels of so different parts of the social security system to reduce uh, the imposition of sanctions uh, on, on families. Essentially, it doesn't, doesn't work uh, as, a, as, a, as a means of supporting people in, into employment or ensuring uh, that they do make progress uh, in terms of uh, work-related activity. I think all the evidence is it actually damages people's chances. It undermines their health, their well-being, um, and makes it, makes it even more difficult to actually uh, manage their lives and, uh, and potentially move into work and increase, increase their hours in work. Did you want to follow up on that, Ben? Oh, Alison. There was, uh, I, was, I know it was touched on from the evidence from Citizens Advice Scotland, so I just I wondered if, if Rob had anything to, to add to that. Yeah, well, I mean, gaps in income um, are a big concern of, of ours and a, a growing concern. Um, last year, around 7,000 um, people were referred to, to food banks from a Citizens Advice Bureau. Um, sanctions are one of the, the problems that we've seen seen cause that, not the only one, administrative errors can come into that, um, transitions between different benefits, for example, employment support allowance and job seekers allowance. Um, but in far too many situations where people are left for an extended period of time with no money, um, and in that situation, their, their options can be, can be quite limited. Um, the Scottish Welfare Fund's done some, some good work, and I think we'd like to see um, continued awareness raising of, of the um, what the Scottish Welfare Fund can give to people in terms of crisis grants. But um, one of the things that I think might be quite, is, is to look behind some of the reasons why, um, why people are being left with no income in the, in the first place, of which sanctions is, is one of them. Hayley, you wanted to come in, didn't you? Um, Enable Scotland works for people who have learning disabilities and our, our client group are particularly vulnerable to work-related conditionality and then, of course, at risk of sanctions. Um, some of that is down to actually practices in, in Job Centre Plus and how they're communicating with vulnerable people. So, for an, in our case, people who have learning disabilities. The decrease in disability employment advisors in Job, Job Centre Plus is a huge issue there. So, people are, are being asked to sign up to conditions that they, they haven't even been properly taken through and they don't un actually understand. So I think that's a huge issue for us that is actually only going to increase um, come April 2017 thanks to the changes introduced by the Welfare Reform and Work Act. Um, we're going to see more and more people who have learning disabilities who, who currently represent one of the largest groups in the work-related activity group in, um, exposed to, to work conditionality and sanctions. So I think that would be a, a really helpful area for, for the committee to explore. Um, and we'd be happy to, to provide further evidence on that. Come in. Yeah. On um, a couple of points around um, the employability programmes and um, the need for them to be um, targeted for, uh, we work with women, so particular groups of women that might find it harder, refugee women, um, carers, um, older women, 
we know that this works, and unfortunately there are, there are very, very few um, targeted support employability programmes um, left. And we also know that um, work programmes and employability help remains incredibly gender segregated, so it's, it's further entrenching gender inequality, so that's, that's a key area to be, to be looked at. Um, and on um, the sort of sanctions issue, one, one key demographic that this really, really hits very hard is lone parents, um, the majority of whom are women. Um, under universal credit, parent flexibilities which currently exist are, are being further eroded, they're being turned into guidance um, rather than regulation. Um, so, and given that we don't currently have a sufficient childcare to support um, lone parents back into work, that's going to be um, a sort of a really, a really key pressure area um, hitting lone, women, lone parents, particularly women that are going to be seeing to be sanctioned more and more because of this. Um, Alison, you wanted to come in? Um, yes, I think Kayleigh, you were highlighting the difficulty that some people have, you know, navigating the benefits system. Um, to be honest, I think most people find it quite challenging at times, and I just wondered, quite like to hear from from Kayleigh and from Rob um, on considering someone for all benefits automatically when they apply to the Scottish Social Security Agency for a particular benefit, because we hear that there are a great number of people who aren't receiving what they are entitled to. Yeah. Um, I think, Alison, that, that's something that, that we would be supportive of um, in terms of what I talked about earlier, this, this opportunity to create a more connected and responsive system. Um, I think that we do need to look at the opportunities that are presented by, by this, this huge change that we're going to see, and one of those things are, are a, is a much more create, connected system that it doesn't involve greater levels of that automatic entitlement in terms of both your awards but also in terms of if you have applied for, for, for one entitlement, the, the passported entitlements that come from that should, should happen automatically without you then having to go, OK, now you can go and fill this form out with your local authority, now you can go and fill this form out and you might get this. It would just make things a lot easier for people. It would probably make things a lot easier for, for welfare rights advisors. Um, but I just I think that there is a real opportunity for us to create actually just a system that, that is that, that much more responsive but also is more easy to access. Like yes, I, I do absolutely believe that there should always be welfare rights advice absolutely embedded in the system but I do think people should be able to advocate for themselves even within that setting so we need to look at how we're communicating with people in ways that is much easier to, to understand rather than 40 page letters that, that I can understand. Rob, did you yeah, want to comment? Yeah, okay. it's um, certainly um, an interesting idea and one that I think that, that would be worthy of consideration. Um, I think like 39% of issues that CABs deal with are related to benefits. Um, it is a, an extremely complicated system and there are, there are many benefits that people might not realise that they're, in, they're entitled to. And one of, the, um, one of the, I suppose, the bread and butter things that CABs will do is go through um, people's circumstances and um, discuss with them what, what things they, they might be entitled to that they, they don't realise they are. So um, I think we support any, anything that would make that process a bit easier. Could, could I just throw something in in that particular one? Uh, listen to Kayleigh and Rob and, and others as well. It's sort of like a one-stop shop that you're, you're talking about where people can access all of the benefits. Uh, and that brings me on to what you were saying, Nicola, about COSLA. Uh, well, local council already, you know, such as concession fares or whatever it may be. So I was just trying to clarify how we would, well, I suppose that's for the committee and the parliament as well, how we would work that. Would someone just present themselves and then you would have a register of agencies that would have the benefits? So i just throw that out if anyone... Yeah. I think when we speak to local government officers about this, there is no appetite in local government for unfettered local discretion. We, we believe that social security in Scotland should be nationally should be a national entitlement, um, but we also believe that the, the solutions around about integration and around about a single customer journey and around about people getting the best local outcomes are delivered locally. And I think that that's the important thing and that's the opportunity. And we have to be a bit ambitious about that. Um, and I don't think that's to say that one agency has to do everything, but I think it means that all of the agencies have to understand the journey that we're trying to achieve. Integration of 
um, health and social care as a direction of travel. It's one that we're, we're, it is a journey, it's not there yet, it's a journey that we're all on and, and we recognise the benefits and the outcomes of that. But I think to, to remove social security back again would, would effectively become another layer of complication that customers don't need. And I think the point that Kayleigh made around about customers should, wherever possible, be able to navigate the system themselves without the requirement for someone else to do that for them. And that, I suppose, leads into the, the discussion around about dignity and respect. You know, everyone deserves the right to, to navigate their, their, own, their own journey and still have the opportunity to opt out and get advice if required. But I don't think we want to be building a system um, where it's so complicated and we have another door. So we, we recognise that customers are still going to have to go through Job Centre Plus to get um, certain benefits. They're also going to still have to come to local government to access lots of the services that we provide. And there's something around about if, if we have another layer built on top of that, it, it doesn't seem like a simplification. Um, it, so I, th I think that's kind of where we're interested in having the conversation. It's not about us having 32 social security systems in Scotland, heaven, heaven forbid. It, it's around about joining that up and thinking about the direction of travel. Thank you. Uh, Alison, do you want to come back in on that? Yeah, and then Adam um, wants to come in. I suppose I wasn't thinking it, it's about adding another layer at all. I think that's probably the last thing any of us would, would want. It's just about making sure that when you approach that first agency, they are more aware of what you are entitled to and can perhaps easier send you in the, in the right direction, that it's more linked up. I suppose it's like, you know, Carer Scotland would like to see a national entitlement that's, you know, understood at that high level to, to remove any inconsistency in what, you know, one claimant is receiving compared to another, just depending on who you happen to, to meet in the job centre. Yeah. want to I, I, I mean, I think this is um, really important, and uh, I, I'm, ba I'm puzzled by the implications of what a number of, um, of, of you are saying, and I just want to try and understand it a bit more. I mean, the devolution of aspects of the United Kingdom's social security is necessarily complicating. Right? It necessarily makes things more complicated than they are at the moment, and I don't, I don't think there's any way of getting around that. You know, we're not devolving all of the United Kingdom Social Security, we're devolving some of the United Kingdom Social Security. And um, the points that Nicola has very powerfully made, I think, are, are very important in the sense that, you know, uh, health and social care will continue to be delivered locally, not nationally. Um, uh, the role of local authorities will continue to be key in terms of uh, a, a, a huge variety of service deliveries. DWP isn't going anywhere. Job Centre Plus is still going to be key. And on top of all of that, we are the consultation proposal is that we create a new and additional Scottish Social Security Agency. So is the implication of what you're saying that we shouldn't be creating a new Scottish Social Security Agency? Um, or, you know, is, 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 would, it be your, would it be your preference for devolved Social Security benefits to be administered through existing institutions, namely DWP, Job Centre Plus, and local authorities, without the creation of a new Scottish Social Security Agency. Is that what you're saying? I, I don't think it's as straightforward as that. I right. think the, the agency having the governance of Social Security policy would work well. There, there's something around about that being in, in the one place, with all of the stakeholders who are involved here having a say in that. I think the, the point that John made around about the delivery of this stuff being absolutely critical, th that's the part that I think, we, we, from a local government perspective, um, we would have to create an infrastructure to provide the governance that effectively the Department for Work and Pensions provides. And that's where we would get into the situation where you would see divergence there. So I think we're talking about policy being um, centrally um, developed. But when it gets into how that actually plays out and how the customer actually accesses that support, th that's where we have to start to have a bit of a, a different conversation. And, and do, our other, I guess, do our other guests agree with that? When he wants yeah. to I think you're correct to say that it's that it is um, complex and necessarily so that um, sort of already um, people may have to deal with with three different agencies: the DWP, HMRC if they receive tax credits, um, the local authority for housing benefit, or, or the Scottish Welfare Fund, and so on. Um, and there'll be another new agency. What I think um, is important. I, th I think it's um, that's not necessarily. Um, that's not necessarily a problem. What I think is probably more important is that um, is that agencies can, can refer to each other and wrote information about what 
what services people might be entitled to um, that are provided by, by other agencies that um, are going to see the, the social security agency who wouldn't tell you anything about, um, about employment support allowance, for instance, or the, and to the job centre, um, a disabled person who wouldn't receive any information about, about disability benefits. If somebody would to come to the CAB, we would look at their, their circumstances holistically um, and, and um, try and help them resolve their problems, no matter which, which agency um, was responsible for them. And I think that the, that integrated approach would, um, would work well and would help um, people um, take up more of the, the benefits that they're, they're entitled to, but maybe aren't claiming at the moment. Thank you. John, did you want to come in? Yep. To, to echo that from Rob, I think the key thing is the kind of relationships and the information sharing between agencies to ensure that wherever you start your journey in terms of looking for, whether it's financial support, social security support, health, social care support, you're then rooted into the other supports that are available. But I think it's also important to recognise that social security is quite a distinct um, form of support that lots of people access social security who don't need health, social care, don't need the other supports that uh, local government and its partners uh, pr provide um, and we need to make sure that we don't confuse the, the two kinds of support and service that are, that are being offered here. I think there is something really important about national deli delivery of social security um, so there's a real role for local government, uh, third sector organisations at local level to support people accessing the system but in terms of actually um, assessment, decision making, making decisions and actually pr delivering uh, benefits to people um, is, a, is a complicated business. Um, I think we've got a lot of, you know, DWP has a lot of experience, we've got bits of local housing benefits delivered locally, Scottish welfare funds delivered locally. I think the reality is that when you have actual local delivery and decision making, you do get um, a real range of uh, outcomes as a result and a varying quality of decision making um, and a, an inconsistency. Um, I think one thing, the other sort of advantage of having a national delivery agency that's actually, um, it's, it's kind of, you're more able to kind of go through a sort of continuous improvement process uh, at national level, people, uh, the, the agency learning um, what works, what doesn't work, um, having a sort of excellent, in term, developing excellence in terms of communications. Uh, again, we have a whole lot of different quality of communications around uh, other uh, local authority benefits and services. So I think there, there is a, a, a strong argument to be made and we would be very keen to make sure that the actual decision-making, delivery, administration of social security remains at a national, well, as, as things have devolved as, as at a Scottish level, but that's not to say there are really important roles and relationships for uh, local government and other uh, partners at local level in terms of supporting access to that system and sh finding ways of sharing information so people don't, don't have to go through unnecessarily multiple kind of assessments where uh, one assessment and one bit of the system might actually be enough to say, okay, well, that would mean you are entitled to this benefit. Kayleigh, you wanted to give in on this? Yeah, it was just really in, in support of, of John's point there around national delivery. Um, and, and in terms of our members' experience of uh, accessing no national concessionary travel scheme, which is a national entitlement that is delivered locally, um, there has been a patchwork of entitlement and it has in, in, at times ended up what has been a, a postcode lottery where in one area, even in terms of accessing the scheme, so in one area, the, the local authority, the forms are available online, in another area, they're available in your, your local library, in another area, you have to go through the, the social work um, teams there. So even just in terms of, of, of us as, as a national body trying to help our members to, to access their entitlements to say to them, even when we were looking at easy read guidance of like, how do you get your bus pass? Because it, it's a huge issue for people who have learning disabilities in terms of access and transport. <laughs> how were we able to even say you go to this, this person and you get your bus, your bus pass form and then you go to that, that person? Because it's different in, in, in different local authority areas. So I think that there is something about that continual improvement, about a new agency gives us an opportunity as well to embed a new ethos, a new culture, start from the beginning in terms of training your staff, like all of that, but 
that is not to say there, that there absolutely shouldn't be a, a local feel. There should be local access points, absolutely. And local authorities have a huge role to play in that. Um, but, but it was just in, in terms of, of our position there. Yeah. Could, could, could I just say as well, and I think we, we need to have a point of clarity on this particular instance. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, the majority of the parties in this parliament ask for all of the welfare system to be devolved. So we are where we are at the moment. Uh, but and the majority of parties in this parliament uh, said that we could do it differently and certainly had the support of most of the agencies, not just around this table, but with this room as well. So that's where we are. And the reason that we were setting up, our plan to set up, the Social Security Agency is to stop the austerity measures and the sanctions which we feel uh, is, is um, endangering people out there, particularly disabled people. So that's the reason why we are where we are. Uh, and I think uh, we can actually deliver a very good agency. It may be complicated, but I think everyone's looking forward to, to doing that and doing something different. Uh, and even speaking to people in the job centres as well, they're saying we've got an opportunity here to create something that's good, that puts the citizens uh, at, the, at the heart of it, uh, rather than bureaucracy. So I'll open it up again. Sorry, Ruth. Thanks, convener. It's, it's kind of along the lines of the um, sort of dignity and respect and, and, and how we treat people. Um, I'd like to ask Alice to expand a bit on um, the point about um, single household payments. Um, I think most of us would intuitively realise where there would be issues with that um, and, and it might um, put vulnerable women and children in harm's way but um, obviously acknowledging that universal credit isn't rolled out everywhere in Scotland but just if she could expand on, on that point for us. Um, absolutely sure so as you say there's um, there's some very st sort of stark and obvious examples where a household payment may be damaging particularly women that are suffering from violence or coercive control um, and that's the sort of real sharp end of the wedge where you can imagine that situation with a woman with no financial autonomy um, over her entitlements. Um, and that would include child benefit, all these sorts of things. Um, so that's a sort of very clear cut example. But also generally there's a, there's a principal argument here around um, individual entitlements. We should, we should have, have autonomy over our own entitlements, over our own financial services. Um, and we've certainly seen... Um, you know, in discussions around household payments of universal credit, real, um, real fear and shock from women um, at the thought that they will no longer have access to their own um, finances. It, the decision seems to be made based on um, a myth that all, all have, we have nuclear families and they all operate in the same way and all budgeting decisions are made um, in a completely equal environment and we know that's not true. Um, women are more likely to be economically dependent on men still in Scotland. They're more likely to hold caring roles. They're more likely um, to be victims of abuse um, and more likely to be um, uh, subject to sort of other financial pressures um, still in Scotland. So having that money as a household payment is incredibly damaging to those women. Um, and of course, that becomes even more highlighted when we're looking at women facing multiple discrimination. So refugee women, um, disabled women, and we, we're already here, huge amounts of um, concern from, from disabled people, women in particular, having no, no access to their own finances. Um, and this will only um, encompass that more. So there's, um, there's real practical examples where it will put women in danger, women and children, and then there's also the principal issue, I'd say, that they are entitlements and they should go to the person they, they're entitled to. Did you want to come back in that? Oh, thank you. I think that's quite clear. Mm. Pauline, mm. do you want to come in? Yeah. Um, the first thing is about the, I suppose, the new agency. Um, <laughs> what concerns me, I mean, I... I, I I accept we've got an opportunity to create something new. But, I mean, my experience is not different from anyone else's. One thing we're absolutely brilliant at in this country is not sharing information. Um, and it strikes me that how do you create an agency then where there's an ethos that shares information necessarily between two systems, at least two systems or more? Um, so the first thing that strikes me is that I've just put this up for exploration is that perhaps there needs to be some legal duties and explore that about information sharing. Because how can you create all, a kind of almost one-stop shop, if you like? I mean, most people who come along and want to claim benefits for the first time are completely lost. Now, you've got on one end of the spectrum people who are very vulnerable, 
But, but anyone who loses their job and who is not depended on the state before is vulnerable. And I know lots of cases where people, they go along to jobs, they're shocked at the attitude and their treatment. They're shocked at the lack of information. They don't know what they're entitled to. And what do you have to do? You wait. You wait and you wait and you wait and you worry until you find out what you're entitled to. And then, you, oh my goodness, I'm getting this and not this. And then they don't know how to challenge it. So, I mean, it's, it, I just think it's a, a massive task on our hands. Um, so the first, I suppose, thing I'd like to explore is just put on the table, do, do we need to perhaps even, dare I say it, go back and talk about some, uh, some powers over sharing of information, if we're going to create an agency that uh, pr pr provides that. Um, secondly, um, yeah, I mean, there's this thing about postcode lottery and how you get into the system. I mean, there's, there's still too many assumptions made about people being online, for example. I mean, there's just, oh yeah, so if you're this age, in this category of age group, you're definitely be online, or if you're this income group, you're definitely online. I mean, in Glasgow, the, the number of people uh, online, I don't know what the figures are now, but it's still probably less than 50%. It's pretty low. So you know, why isn't there a uniform approach to this? Um, yes, people can, well, I suppose the reason why there can't be a uniform approach to it is that if you then put all your or your investment in an online system and you can't perhaps create it. But I mean, I do think we have to think very seriously um, about creating that, that front door, uh, easy accessible system um, where people can uh, get all this information. Um, but I just wanted to make that point. I think it applies to a whole range um, of people uh, when they go to it. So anyway, that, 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 that was really my question, whether anyone thought there was scope for um, legislation around information sharing. Rob, do you want to come in? Um, on the, the information sharing point, I think it's is it one and something that the committee might want to explore as part of its, mm -hmm. its scrutiny of the, of the bill. Um, it's an area that can, that can get quite complex and we can see it through our, through our own work, for instance, in that um, we wouldn't necessarily share information with with DWP as for a confidential service and there are issues there. But we also see um, there's even within the Department of Work and Pensions itself where different different teams aren't sharing information with others for various reasons. And that can mean that, um, that a person's entire circumstances aren't taken into account. Um, on the point about digital, this is, this is something that's really important. Um, we're... Um, at the moment in, um, in Musselburgh and in Inverness, we're seeing the rollout of um, what's known as the full service of universal credit. Um, this is universal credit for, for all people who would have claimed one of the six benefits it replaces. Um, and one of the biggest issues that um, Miras have seen since it started rolling out there earlier this year um, is um, it pulls problems with digital access. Uh, we did a survey of CAB clients last year, and that showed that about 36% um, would, wouldn't be able to make a, a claim for benefit online without assistance. In practice, it, um, from what we're seeing, it may be even higher than that, and that rises even further for, for disabled people. Um, so I think that um, sort of digit, the role of digital um, and also the, the universal credit um, rollout across Scotland, particularly the, the full service rollout, which, um, which will soon be expanding to other areas, would be something that I think would be um, that the committee may well want to take a, a look on because I think it's going to be, be something that um, will start to affect, affect more and more, more people um, and um, be a, an excellent thing to have in your work programme. Thank you. John, was that an answer to that? Because George just want to come in. George. You wanted to come in. Yes, uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to ask about uh, the Citizen Advice Scotland's uh, evidence that you've written, evidence you gave us, was the fact that you said that one of the things we should look at is the uh, use of medical assessments and existing medical evidence and determine disability awards. Now, uh, I just wondered how, because we've obviously, as MSPs, have horror stories 
in all our constituencies with regards to how this has been going about. So I'd like you to maybe elaborate on that and why you think we should actually have that at the core of a lot of the work that we're doing. I think there's, there's um, really two issues of, of interest here. One is that, um, I suppose, lessons that can be learned from the new system because um, some of the medical ev evidence relates to, to personal independence payment, which is to be devolved. Um, some of it relates to um, employment support allowance, um, which isn't. Um, and the main problem is eventually is um, how information is obtained. At the moment, um, um, if in law, if somebody was um, to require uh, additional medical evidence that would be on the responsibility of the DWP, um, DWP to pursue it, um, and GPs are, are paid for um, for ESA um, assessments, they're not paid for personal independence payment um, additional evidence. Where some of the problems start to come in is if um, someone um, wants to, feels that they, they would want to submit additional evidence to, um, to their personal independence payment claim, or to, um, um, they feel that the, the decision that's been made isn't correct and they want a mandatory consideration or an appeal, they would look to um, get additional evidence. In some cases, GPs will charge them for that, the, which is around £30, although we've had some evidence of GPs um, charging even more than that. Um, the problems that relate to medical evidence when it, when it gets to DWP, um, firstly, that um, there's been too many cases where medical evidence goes missing, whether that's lost in the post, whether that's lost in the, um, in the mail handling centre in Wolverhampton, or whether it's just not been processed onto the system. Um, but there's a fine of people having to then go back to their GP for more medical evidence. Um, the issues where... Mm -hmm. that point, do you have a percentage of how many of these actually go missing? You know, is there, is there any figures on that? Um, it, would, it would be anecdotal. Um, ah. um, but um, I can... I can have a look and see if I can find some. No, that would be quite thing. interesting because uh, you've already mentioned the fact that it's the cost on the individual plus the fact that if they've gone to that extent that for these to go missing, you know, the stress of going through the whole process as is, that just makes things worse. Yeah, I think absolutely. And I think there's, there's a lot of, um, of lessons learned for the, um, for the new system in there as well as um, addressing a, a situation that um, they say affects a lot of, of people and that... Um, um, and that it would come to a CAB or to their MSP for, um, for help and advice about. Do you want to come back in on that one, George? I think Kayleigh wanted to say something. Uh, I think Nicola was first, and Gordon, and then Kayleigh. I think just to go back on the point of, sh of sharing data, um, I think it's interesting that the evidence that we took for the Scottish Welfare Fund, which was, was the last one that was um, devolved to Scotland, um, people assumed that if they told one council blouse, the rest of the council knew, and that came through very strongly in the evidence sessions that the committee took, but it also came through very strongly in some of the work we did at local authority level. Um, and I think Pauline's right around about there being a natural nervousness in organisations to share information, um, that that's true in local government, it's true in the Department for Working Pensions, and unless I'm very wrong and the culture is very, very different, it will be true of the agency. So unless that's absolutely crystal clear, what information can be shared, what customers' consent looks like, we, will, we may well end up with a situation where it's difficult to share that information. But certainly our experience from the Welfare Fund is that people just expect, if they tell, um, quite naturally, I'm not, I'm, I don't disagree with that, but it, it's around about how we actually make that, that a reality. And on the point of digital access, um, I, I think you're right, Universal Credit has slowed down, but that doesn't mean it's not causing real issues on the ground. Um, as of the end of this financial year, we will have five local authorities in Scotland who will be on full service. So the, the issues that Alice mentioned around about um, single household payments, the way housing costs are paid, um, the fact that they go straight to the customer as opposed to the landlords, th these are things that I think the committee, it would be timely for the committee to take some evidence on that type of stuff. These are flexibilities that um, the Scottish Government um, will have devolved and will have the opportunity to, to use and I think we need to build a really good evidence base about what's happening on the ground 
what we could actually do to make that better. Certainly for our organisations as, as social landlords, they're worried about how customers um, are going to continue to be able to pay, make their rental payments without some assistance. Um, and I think, I think the points that Alice made around about single household payments are, are, are critical, that we, we get in early and try and do as much as we possibly can on that. Uh, thank you. Uh, Gordon, you <coughs> Gordon, you're next. Perhaps it's a good point for me to come in, because coming back to the point that Nicola Dickey has just mentioned, talking about evidence bases, uh, I have a sort of more general question, but it, it might be useful to make it specific by coming back to something that um, John Dickey might be able to help us with, because it's referred to in the Child Poverty Action Group Scotland uh, information. Um, one of the things you highlight ref relates to the two-child policy, and I think the statement in the paper is that this is likely to increase poverty amongst larger families. Now, I'm just wondering what evidence base there is for a statement like that, because I suppose the question is what consequences uh, a tax credit system that is limited to uh, providing tax credits to two-child families has on for example, behaviour, some might say, well, does it have an effect on the number of children families have? I'm not saying it does. Um, things like that, or uh, on the other hand, one might say we have, we are told, an ageing population. So, in fact, families having more children on that level could be considered a good thing. So there's, there's different ways of looking at it. What I'm interested in is, are there specific studies, including from other European countries, for example, that have addressed these issues. I think we're probably all aware that different countries have looked at this specific issue. Um, just to make sure that we are not, in what we are doing, basing our approach to things on old or uninformed assumptions, or indeed simply trying to reinvent the wheel when others may have looked at all of these issues and compared them and seen what the consequences are. 10, 20 years down the, down the road. Um, just wondering what your, your comments are on that are. First of all, the evidence base, the database that uh, a sentence like that is based on, and whether you have a comment on the general question of uh, how we should approach looking at things to ensure we don't, uh, in light of the new opportunity, as the convener has said, it might not be the new opportunity that some might have wanted, but such as it is, that we make sure we don't go down the same lines with the same consequences. I mean, I suppose the first thing is absolutely the, the evidence in here. I suppose what we're urging this, the committee to do is to scrutinise, take evidence, understand how that policy impacts on children and families in Scotland. So there's a role for this, this committee to, to do that. Uh, in terms of our um, the, the evidence that it's likely to lead to an increase in child poverty. We already know that uh, larger families uh, are more at risk. Children growing up in larger families are at higher risk of child poverty than other children. So 36% of children currently growing up in families with three or more children growing up in poverty compared to around one in five children in, uh, growing up in poverty generally. So there's an increased risk of... It seems fairly clear that if you then remove... Um, significant source of financial support from those larger families, that's likely to uh, reduce the amount of income they'll have, uh, increase the risk of poverty in those families. Um, in terms of the behavioural kind of impacts of that, I suppose the reality is people don't, um, you know, people's circumstances change all the time, so parents, um, you know, become unemployed, become sick, uh, disability, their, their incomes change, their entitlement to, uh, to, to, to tax credits in the future universal credit will change. Um, and if there's a sort of arbitrary, there's a third child or a third or more child there, already there, already in existence, already part of that family, no longer uh, it has, it has any entitlement to financial support, then inevitably those families are going to be worse off than they would otherwise be, and those are families that already were at increased risk of poverty um, already. So I suppose that's, that's why we think removing financial support from uh, ch um, families with, you know, uh, from third, third child and families um, is likely to increase um, child poverty. I think that's something that we need to look at how that impacts, and more importantly, I suppose, what we can do within um, devolved 
Social Security and wider devolved powers to ensure that the implications of that are considered and what more can we do to support those families who are at particular risk of poverty and are losing an important source of financial support. So are you, are you looking primarily at immediate and self-evident, as you would see it, impacts of this rather than long-term consequences or results of a policy in 10, say 20, 30 years' time? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to look at what are the, what, what are the immediate impacts for those, those families, what are the likely impacts for those families in the future. Um, I suppose that, that, that idea that will drive how many children families have seems unlikely given that in many cases, people's entitlement to benefit emerge, or their, their, their need for additional financial support emerges long after they've had their children. Um, so I'm not aware of any modelling that suggests that this will have a, um, a positive impact on levels of child poverty. Um, I need to go back and see to what extent this has been factored into. There's been some significant modelling done by both um, Institute for Fiscal Studies and um, Resolution Foundation looking at the wider impact of um, reforms to Social Security and how that's impacting on levels of child poverty. And the modelling suggests that levels of child poverty across the UK uh, look set to increase dramatically between now and the end of the decade. Whether this particular reform has been modelled into that, I don't think it has yet. So there, there are... Um, those better able to model these things in the longer term, the longer term looking at these things, it would be important to take, uh, take, take that evidence into account as well. So you would agree the committee needs to look at not just the immediate, which obviously is an important effect of things, but also the, the longer term effect of things? But then we know that the long term uh, effects of reducing the levels of financial support families are entitled to is modelled to increase child poverty dramatically. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I've got five people waiting to make a contribution or a question. Uh, Kayleigh. Um, I was um, actually just looking to, to come back on, on George's question around um, medical assessments. Is that OK to bring it back? To yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it was just in, in, in terms of Enable Scotland's experience that, that specific medical assessments have not been a positive experience for, for many people who have learning disabilities who are particularly vulnerable to negative decisions in a process that involves them personally communicating their difficulties and, and issues that they face. Um, and in fact, they only provide a snapshot of, of, a, of a claimant's life rather than a, a long-term picture. Um, also related is, is the point about um, information sharing that, that, that Pauline made. Um, evidence gathering is, is obviously part of um, the social security system. We need to know what, what people's needs are um, in order to determine the, their entitlement. Um, if we're moving away from the, the specific medical assessment, which I'd probably welcome, um, then there is an opportunity to look at how, and, and also embedding that, that degree of automaticity, it, it, it is looking at information sharing across different agencies around, like, so for, the, for example, the NHS, for example, education authorities. So people are assessed in terms of their needs for, for support in school. They're, they're diagnosed by the NHS. Um, I would obviously uh, caution that statement with that would be appropriate information sharing and it would always be with, with a person's consent. Um, but I think that that's part of creating a more connected system, creating a more user-friendly system that isn't doesn't involve someone running about and gathering their own evidence and it also doesn't involve specific medical assessment. Um, that has been quite unpleasant for people. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, yes, uh, just briefly on the, the sort of evidence aspect of all this, um, I, I think that um, those of us who've been counsellors or, or, or MSPs before will have seen, you know, right in front of our faces some of the evidence of, of the hardship that's, that's caused. But I think also that certainly my own local authority had gathered numbers, specific numbers on the, the real families who would be impacted by, by this policy. So I don't know if that's something that, that COSLA could assist with, with <laughs> getting for us. I might, may I come in with another question? Yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, in terms of expectations, I mean, I think we're all conscious that, you know, we don't, ha we don't have everything. We don't have a, a, a blank sheet of paper. And I was interested to hear Simon um, in particular mentioned it um, from Carers Scotland about um, whenever we have an announcement or we um, you know say something's coming or something's going to happen the expectations are, are, are raised and I just would be interested to hear um, folks views on how we can um, remain positive about what we can do um, but you know not give um, 
you know, set expectations accordingly and, and, and make sure that we're not causing um, any undue um, upset while we're making the changes. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, Alice. I wanted to come back um, very briefly on the on the issue of um, of the two children rule um, and the sort of uh, the question around long term effects and short term consequences. And I think um, absolutely right. The committee should be considering both short term and long term, but it's the um, it's the effect on equality um, and, and poverty reduction and the aims of um, a good social security system that should be being taken into account. And just um, just on the issue of um, the limiting to two children. Um, which borders on you know, policing of women's bodies and particularly women on low income. And I think that's something I just wanted to make the point that that is, um, we, we, you know, we should not be discouraging um, women from making choices around their own bodily autonomy based on if they can, um, can access a certain benefit. Um, and to make the point that this affects different women very differently in Scotland. So minority ethnic women, refugee women, low income women are more likely to have more, uh, more children and larger families. Um, and this is... Um, so this is you know, discriminatory and I think we need, we need to come back to the ideals of um, dignity and respect and how we're making sure that we're, we're not um, having rules for certain different demographics of people within this. So I just wanted to make those points. Thank you. Adam? Well, I feel I should declare an interest as the father of four children. But uh, <laughs> um, I wanted to, um, first of all, I just wanted to make a, um, a comment about um, some of the discussion around information sharing. Um, I, I, I think it would be helpful if we distinguished um, two, different, two completely different sorts of information sharing. The first sort of information sharing is when an individual turns up uh, to whatever agency it is um, and has to um, tell their life story. Um, and then there's a frustration which goes directly to the um, points about dignity, fairness and respect uh, when that individual then has to tell the whole life story again to you know, another job coach or to another agency. The, the, one, one of the reasons why that might sometimes have to happen is because the first agency may not lawfully share the sensitive data about that individual with another agency because it would be incompatible with data protection laws. And we've just seen um, in a different context a unanimous Supreme Court decision striking down aspects of the named persons legislation because of illegal data sharing uh, provisions in that, in that legislation. We need to be careful about that. But the other element of information sharing is um, uh, the sharing by agencies of information to individuals about the range of benefits that are available. And that, that it seems to me, is where we can and, do, and must do uh, much better. But I just think it might be useful to distinguish those two different sorts of uh, information sharing. I had two quick questions, if I may convene, to really inspired by uh, some of the things that John Dickey uh, has said. Um, uh, the first question, uh, John, is um, how does um, Child Poverty Action Group measure uh, poverty? I know, I, I know I should know the answer to this, so apologies, but um, uh, I was struck by the child poverty consultation document that the measure of poverty that the Scottish Government is suggesting that we use uh, is just about income. Um, uh, and the Joseph Rantree Foundation this week published its comprehensive How to Solve UK uh, Poverty uh, document, which is in interesting and challenging in equal measure. Um, and one of the interesting things about that uh, document, I don't know if you've had the chance to, to read it yet, it was only published this week, uh, is that uh, their proposed measure of, um, of poverty is quite different from just focusing on income. It also looks at, um, uh, at cost of living and a whole range of other factors. I just wonder if you could reflect on that. The second question was, you mentioned in your first uh, contribution this morning, that one of the striking omissions from the Scottish Government's social security consultation was that there was no mention anywhere of the top-up power. Um, and uh, we all know that the, the number one ask of Child Poverty Action Group Scotland is that the top-up power is used uh, to raise uh, child benefit by five pounds uh, per child, in, per, per eligible child in, in, in Scotland. And I just wondered if you had any reflections on why you thought the Scottish Government had, one, not mentioned child benefit anywhere in that 145-page page document, and two, not mentioned the top-up power anywhere. So, so uh, I mean, I know, I know the question has been directed to John, but we do have another two members who wanted to come in. So, George, is your question related? Unrelated. Unrelated, well. And Alison, is your question related to that? Actually, I would say that it is. OK, um, Alison, on you go, and then... Ruth was speaking about expectations, and... You know, people are aware that we do have devolved powers that enable us to tackle issues. Um, you know, from April 2017, we'll see another round of welfare benefit cuts, including a £30 a week um, cut to employment and support allowance. So we have, as a parliament now, the means to mitigate 
um, some of the impacts of these cuts. So I'd probably like to hear a bit more about whether or not we're in a position to do that. April 2017 isn't far, you know, it's not far away. Is the Scottish Government, is this Parliament being active enough in making sure that we're using these powers properly? And obviously, we do have to make decisions then about who we're taxing and how much we're taxing. But clearly, you know, the public now is well aware that we have these powers coming and we can do something about this if we choose to do so. John, you come in and then George, you come in with yours. What do we mean by child poverty? It basically means families not having the resources to bring their children up in a way that's socially acceptable, that uh, meets the standards of the society they're living in. In our society, that's primarily about not having enough money to buy food, to pay the bills, to meet energy costs, uh, all the rest of it, to ensure that children are able to fully participate at school. So income, there's a good reason for income being at the heart of any measure of, of poverty um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a modern society like Scotland. In terms of the, the, the four key measures that have been proposed in the Scottish Government's consultation, they very much kind of uh, build on, reflect the existing um, or the, the measures that have been used at a UK level for the last uh, 15 years or more. Uh, also measures that are used internationally in terms of understanding um, how, far how, how far behind uh, low-income families with children are falling. So looking at the headline measure, looking at numbers of children living in families with less than 60% of median income. But important to note that the, the consultation also proposes a, a, a low-income and material deprivation measure. So it's looking at what are actually children missing out on in terms of, um, you know, going on holidays, having a winter coat, all the rest of it, being able to participate in, in, in mainstream activities. So there's a, there's a, a, a non-income measure in there as well. I think there is something to be said for looking at uh, subsidiary measures that kind of look at those issues around uh, the costs that families face, particularly in a devolved context where there's maybe, uh, there are other levers and other powers that we can use to reduce the costs that families face, whether that's the costs of, uh, you know, through fuel poverty programmes, reducing uh, um, the, 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 the people's fuel bills. Mm -hmm. School, school uniform, whether it's improving school clothing grants, um, reducing the, the charging for school trips and, and, and all the rest of it. There are ways of tackling those kind of non-income measures. So I think, it's, uh, I think it's absolutely right that we have income at the heart of any measure of poverty and child poverty, but also that we, um, and I suppose that's one of the other things I was going to talk about in terms of uh, the linkages between the Social Security Bill and the Child Poverty Bill, is that uh, I think it was mentioned earlier the, 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 the child poverty bill that proposes putting the Scottish government's uh, ambitions to eradicate child poverty into legislation, into statute, uh, with our um, uh, duties on uh, the government to produce uh, a strategic delivery plan every five years to report on progress for a measurement framework to sit alongside that. And I suppose that's the kind of thing we can look at how do you put into that measurement framework. Um, both measures that would help to understand the contribution that Social Security and devolved Social Security is playing, but also uh, understand the impact of uh, efforts to, re to reduce the costs that families face and the contribution that that can make. Uh, in terms of the, the top-up power, you know, clearly this is a power that now that will, will be coming to this, this, this Parliament. Um, why child benefit? Um, families with children have been the sort of household type. <laughs> They've been particularly... Uh, uh, seen their incomes um, squeezed over the last uh, 10 years or so, or uh, the last seven or eight years. Um, there's a, uh, we've kind of done some modelling in terms of the £5 top up, which seemed to be a kind of figure that uh, could be meaningful. Um, actually, it would mean that uh, around 30,000 fewer children would be living in poverty than otherwise would be living in poverty. Uh, a 14% reduction in the numbers of children living in poverty than would otherwise be in poverty. Real money into families' pockets, tackling uh, the, the, the lack of income that prevents their children from being able to, 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 to make the most of, uh, of, of their experience. Yeah, I, I wouldn't know why that's not been put into the Constitution. It's clearly a, 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 we'll ask. A, it's, it's, it's a, it's a big ask. I think we're aware of that. So the costings would be for that. I mean, we've kind of indicative costings are around £256 million pounds a year. So we're not uh, naive to, you know, that's a big chunk of government spending. But it's not an impossible chunk of government spending. If government in Scotland is, is absolutely serious about eradicating child poverty, one key way of doing that is ensuring that more money goes to uh, support families with the cost of raising their children. And this is a very clear lever in which that could be achieved. Thank, thank you very much, John. George. Yes, 
Uh, I'd like to, we got some evidence from some people following the committee on Twitter, and one was Lynn Williams, an unpaid carer from Glasgow. She's actually from Paisley, convener. So I uh, just thought I'd make that correction. But she actually said, uh, to look at the reality of disability living allowance to personal and dependence payment transfer and what it might mean with the devolution of the new powers. And I think this is probably a good question to put to Simon, because in uh, the Carers Scotland, they actually mentioned about some of the problems, you know, you've got a section here, consideration of support of individuals impacted by wel uh, UK welfare reform. And I think it's probably an important, because we have so many carers in Scotland, and currently with the new pills that are coming over, there's an expectation as well. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on how we can deal with uh, that process. Um, <coughs> um, well, I think um, the issue that we've that we've raised is with the reassessments that are going on with people. So, obviously, all the disability benefits are being devolved, but there's cons. You know, you get your carers allowance based on somebody having one of those other benefits. So, but you, if so, so somebody gets reassessed and they lose their their DLA or their, their relevant benefit, the caring role doesn't change. So, with somebody who's in a caring role doing a caring role, that doesn't change because, but you suddenly lose. The you know 60 pounds, 62 pounds a week that you get for your for your benefit as a direct consequence. So, um, and obviously the Carers Act that's now going forward is recognising carers in a really broad sense. So it's not just people who um, are in receipt of carers allowance who are still a very small major minority of the number of carers there are in Scotland. But there's a particular co you know so where we've got that small cohort of people already drawing down that benefit for them to be losing it but the other circumstances don't change um, it's an issue that we need to sort of I think that's a point that uh, having known Lynn and uh, being our MSP as well I'm aware of our own personal circumstances I've got to declare an interest because I'm, I'm a carer as well but I think Stacey would argue that point whether she cares for me or I care yeah. for her but uh, the whole point is uh, uh, Lynn and others are finding themselves in a position where A they've got the massive forms to fill in for a start, you know, the, 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 the whole process is uh, scary uh, for her. And when they go through that process, you've got a situation where, you know, they may be rejected, but uh, they've almost got to prove their disability of their loved one or family member. And also, when they appeal, 80% of them tend to get it back on, uh, on the appeal. You know, there, there's something bizarre about the whole system. Is there, is there a way that you think, Simon, or others might think here that we could maybe make that better or find a way around it? You know, just a starter for 10 would do. Um, well, I haven't got a straightforward answer to that. I mean, what we're, what we're setting out in the Social Security Bill is, um, is to take a different approach, isn't it? So we're not giving people... Um, incentives to make savings. You know, we should be incentivising people to make sure that there are fewer people entitled to benefits that aren't receiving them. You know, at the moment, we know loads of people don't claim benefits they're entitled to. Loads of pensioners aren't pulling down their full benefits. Loads of cohorts of people aren't getting them because nobody told them. It's not a duty of DWP staff to, to tell people what their entitlements are. You have to ask for stuff. If we're going to do it the other way around, then at least we're starting from a different place, aren't we? And, you know, in terms of, uh, even in the outline consultation and stuff, there's things about um, trying to set up a system where we get it right first time, so we're not having lots of appeals, and then therefore you shouldn't have so many successful appeals. Um, I mean, for me, it seems like an abject failure of a system that if 80% of people are winning cases on appeal, there's something wrong with the system. You know, it's, pre it's just on the face of it. What's you know, it's, it's costing a fortune to do. It's putting people in a really difficult position. The appeals are taking a lot of time. They cost money to administer. Get it right first time, and then you don't have to deal with that. And when we're dealing with people, as we know, who are being assessed, who have had you know, lifelong conditions, um, you know, have got terminal conditions and things, and they're all still in the, still being forced to go through these assessment processes and feel um, vulnerable um, and and suddenly to get left with no, no resources at all. I think um, taking the different approach that's being proposed is a good thing. I don't know how we can just mitigate about those. We've got, you know, we've got to live through this change process. I mean, we're, we're redesigning the, the plane while it's in flight, aren't we? So this situation of the here and now, for people like Lynn, um, 
and how to make it better going forward. Um, so sorry, I haven't got a, a, a silver bullet or anything to say the solution to that problem is. Maybe others have got better ideas. I'm, I think you know there are lots of people in, in difficult situations at the moment. Clearly, we're getting lots of examples. Other, I'm sure others are as well in terms of the transition of, of benefits. Us. Are giving up paid employment too effectively as their, uh, their loved ones. Uh, uh, mobility or uh, their, their, their disability gets worse, they end up giving up paid employment and this is their only access to income. So my way of looking at it is how do we find a way to, you know, make sure that everybody, uh, there is a problem with the system, obviously, as you quite rightly say, if 80% get it, but it was originally just a numbers game. It wasn't thinking about individuals and it was just, let's make a cut. And that was probably the fault of the system. But it's us as we move on, how do we deal with the dignity respect agenda to make sure that we can actually deliver on that? Totally. No, no. I know Rob wants to come in and then Ruth wants to come in and Kayleigh as well. Rob. Yeah, I mean, I think it's entirely correct that um, the process of transferring from DLA to, to PIP um, has been a difficult one um, and one that's that we've seen a, a huge number of problems about in disability benefits and how um, around about the largest issue that, um, single issue that, that CABs will, will deal with, um, a hugely stressful process for disabled people um, and their carers. Um, some of the problems, um, certainly sort of lessons that we can learn for, um, for future when, when disability benefits are devolved but also the problems that, that people will see now because it, it'll be a few years before, um, before a Scottish disability benefits system's up and running, by which point um, it's expected that, um, that almost everyone will be, have been migrated over to PIP, so there's, there's many more of these assessments to come. Um, I think the biggest problem for us um, have been around um, the, um, around the use of, of medical assessments for, um, for almost all um, cases um, found that they don't necessarily lead to the correct decisions. Um, there's been, um, although this has improved recently, a, a long, um, lengthy delays for to actually get an assessment in the first place. I mean, we were um, when PIP was first introduced, we were seeing delays for up to a, a year before somebody would get assessed um, to see whether they would get any support or not, um, and. Um, and the, um, the assessments themselves that um, um, we found sort of quite, um, quite impersonal, It'd be talking to, to a stranger about things like whether, um, whether they could go to the toilet or not. Um, and um, one of the things I think particularly, I think key for the new system is to um, make as much use of um, existing evidence, whether that's from, um, from the claimant themselves um, who will know their condition better than anybody else, um, from friends and family, um, from GPs, from community psychiatric nurse, support workers. I think only after um, it's been exhausted and it's impossible to make a decision that you would look to, to go to, a, um, to an outside assessment, um, which would I think, reduce a lot of the stress involved in the process, reduce a lot of the delays, um, and make um, the experience a lot better for sort of Scotland's disabled citizens. Yeah. Ruth, did you want to? Yeah, I was um, enjoying everyone's interesting contributions, and I realised that I didn't get an answer to my question. So, <laughs> I wonder if uh, maybe Simon and, and Kayleigh might be able to reflect on that that point around um, setting expectations and making sure that we don't kind of cause more stress and worry as we're as we're progressing with with things. Well, Kayleigh may answer that particular one, but I know Kayleigh wants to come in, and then perhaps Simon, you want to come back in again. Um, I, I'll, I'll try to uh, come to that in, in, in my response, absolutely. Um, it was just to, to pick up on, on George's point around the, the form filling and, and the experience of, of carers and family members who, who are supporting a loved one through that process. Um, you've given Lynn a voice in this committee, and I'd quite like to give one of our, our members a voice. Um, uh, this is from a parent who has a child with a, a learning disability. She said, claiming DLE is difficult, the forms are horrendous, and it is so upsetting having to justify every bit of support your child needs and having to write in minute detail all the things your child can't do and then just feeling like a waster because you're having to claim financial support for your child. So I think we need to look at these 
parents and families who are being confronted by these deficit focused forms and processes and look at the, how we can think about things a bit differently um, in terms of the content of forms, in terms of approach, in terms of the support that people are given when they're going through that process. Um, there's also been various submissions on, on, on carers allowance um, and I think that, that that's a, an important a, important um, source of support for, for the committee to explore and, and, and obviously for the parliament to explore. Um, around carers allowance I think that, that there's also um, a, a, a sort of a, another a dimension of that to explore where it's around when your loved one is hospitalised. Um, at the moment um, the Scottish Government have made a, a, an extremely welcome announcement that the, the 84 day rule around um, children who had received DLE um, being hospitalised, um, that that will be abolished and, and we won't see a suspension of payability of, of disability benefits and therefore the carers allowance that's associated to that won't be abolished. But there is also a not dissimilar rule of 28 days that applies to adults um, in receipt of um, disability benefits and therefore their carers. So I think that's maybe something to explore. I, I haven't costed it out. Um, but I think that, that, that are, there is a, an argument to be made in terms of the costing of the impact on, on other areas of policy. So for example, um, where someone is hospitalised and their benefits have stopped, etc., that then has an impact on health because there's a, an, an issue around delayed discharge where, the, where the, they need to go through the whole process to get their, their support back in place, etc. So I think that's something to, to explore. Um, around communicating changes um, and setting expectations, I think that's, that's hugely important. Um, we're currently preparing for a meeting with our members on Saturday um, where we, we will be exploring their views around um, the social security consultation. Um, so it's, it's absolutely important to, to set expectations on, on, on when, when changes are likely to be made, what, what limitations there are to those changes. Um, and also to not frighten people because people have just, a lot of disabled people have just been through changes where they change from DLA to PIP. So I think um, what, what we'll be doing is just giving that full explanation in, a, in an easy and accessible way, but also always ha emphasising that there is a welfare rights advisor who works for us who will be able to do a full benefits assessment if you if you are worried about anything. So I think that there's that. Um, I don't have a, a, an, another, another advice around that. Thank, thank you very much, Kayleigh. Did you want to come back in and Simon, that direct point? Just on the communications thing, I, mean, I think um, you know, having a clear timetable explains to people when things might happen and, and it's not, I mean, we're all doing that through our own networks and stuff, and, we, and hopefully we're all saying the same things. Um, so having, you know, having a clear thing that's accurate that we can all use as a template for that communication through our own channels. But also, you know, that's not going to catch everybody because there are people out there who are not engaging or are not linked into um, to the sector, the voluntary sector or the public sector. So at some point, I think we need to have a clear sort of government-led communications programme and stuff because otherwise there's a, you know there's a danger of um, misinformation um, and, it, and it leads to all of you know your casework will go up because people are coming and asking I've heard about this when am I going to get it we get phone calls about it and all you know, so it's um, not clogging up the system but it's just not helpful really um, and I think there are some good stories to tell here as you know I mean obviously people are nervous about changes because they think it might be negative you know so we've got the opportunity to say some good things um, why not take those opportunities, I think, so. Sorry, it's, it's not a question, it's more just a quick point that, that I suppose is one of the most important things during the change is to make sure that people fall through the gaps. So I suppose we have to kind of marry that slight tension with giving a really clear timetable of when things are going to happen and actually getting it right and having a, having a smooth transition. I, th I think that's the point that's been made by mostly everyone here about the smooth transition and certainly something the committee will, will certainly be looking at. Alice, you wanted to come in. Yeah, just briefly, so yeah, thank you for the question because I think it's, it's really important not to um, ignore the sort of strain on mental health that social security changes do have on people and I think all of the agencies here will um, come, come across that. So yeah, communication and 
Um, I think also acknowledging that it's a very, very complex process is, is always useful um, in this. Um, I just wanted to come back very briefly on the, um, on the issue of carers and, um, and disabled people and, and make the point that the move from, um, from DLA to PIP is, is premised on significantly reduced incomes for, for many people. And it's important to, um, while we're talking about obviously the, the delivery in the systems are very important, but we also need to look at adequacy of income and actually... Is this reducing poverty? Is this making people's lives better? Are people accessing um, what they need to be able to access? Um, we would advocate for um, a living wage for carers. Um, and we've also called for, um, for pilots of citizens' basic income projects and exploring these, these ambitious and sort of positive visions of, of way we could, ways we could do things um, a little bit differently. Um, and also something for the committee that I think it's, it's vital that the impacts of social security on these um, groups facing multiple discrimination, so particularly disabled women, for example, is really vital to be monitored um, and make sure that um, the voices of people impacted on are, are sort of heard throughout the process. So again, thank you for, for inviting us all here to, to give evidence. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank, thank you very much. And uh, I think it's been a, you know, a wonderful you know, morning, plenty of ideas. And I did, I did open up by asking you all about the key priorities. We've certainly got plenty uh, here today to, to think about as well. So once again, can I, I thank you very much for coming along. It's been very interesting. look forward to perhaps uh, meeting you all again at another evidence session, possibly, anyway. So I'll suspend this, this uh, session for five minutes. And members, if they wish to have a five-minute break as well, where we on to the next item.
we'll go there now. Remind members that we're going back into public sector. Just, just to remind members, we're going to go back into public sector and now. Okay. Okay. Now. Uh, we resume the committee and uh, it's agenda item two uh, on, on your, in your papers if you just turn to agenda item two and it's petition PE1571 on food bank funding. So to consider the petition, it's the name of John Beattie, it was lodged in July 2015 and it called for the Scottish Government to provide direct funding to food banks. The uh, paper that you have there in front of you sets out the context and the work that's already been undertaken by the Public Petitions Committee on this petition, and you have a number of suggestions there in, in the paper as well. Uh, can I ask members what their views are on this petition? Do you want to come in, George? Well, yeah, I can, I'd probably say the suggestions that they've got in section in 12 for the committee to maintain a watching brief and the committee's wider work on social security and ask the Scottish Government to keep uh, both the committee and petitioner informed of any response. I think that seems pretty reasonable to me. Mark? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I've been contacted by some uh, food banks, particularly those who have um, missed out an allocation of funding on the, the government's um, emergency uh, food fund and I think it would be interesting if we could hear back from the government um, the level of demand there was, just how oversubscribed or not that fund was and how many organisations are, are missed out because th the view that's been put to me is certainly that some of these uh, food banks are feeling that what they do, their emergency food supply to people who are in desperate need is, is coming under real pressure and, uh, and is at risk of not existing at all. Um, so just to see if the government have done any work as to whether um, the food banks and people who are working voluntarily to provide a service are actually still going to be able to do so. Okay. Ruth, you wanted to come in, and Alison? Yeah. And Adam. Convener, I, I, I think I would ag ag agree with um, the recommendations there, and I'd, I'd just like to say that, you know, I, I commend the work that, that indeed volunteers do in providing emergency food, but I, I don't think that food banks should be part of our social security system. I think they're a, they're a sign that a social security system isn't working. They're not a solution to it. I think, um, you know, in terms of addressing um, food poverty, there are, there are different things that, that, that should be explored. Okay. Alison, what is it going? Yeah, um, I think clearly if some food banks are struggling, that's tremendously serious for those who are relying on them, as much as I would hope that nobody had to rely on them. But I also note that you and Gar from the Trussell Trust have said it's a crucial thing to avoid ever being assimilated within the welfare state. And I know the Short Life Working Group has reported, and I believe the Cabinet Secretary said she will consider the report in full and respond in due course, but um, I too would support action suggested at point 12. Adam, do you want to come in? Yes, I would just to agree with uh, George Adam, I too would support the action in paragraph 12. Mark, you, you raised that specific point. We, could we come to a compromise and, and uh, look at the action which most of the people I see on the committee are agreeable on and also write a letter to, to, to the CABSEC? Yep. Would, that, would that suffice for the committee? Yep. Okay, thank you. That's great. Uh, and I um, call this meeting to an end. <laughs>